Hey everyone, how's it going? I uh, hope you've enjoyed all the, the good music that they've been playing here. It makes a, going to a database conference like really worth it, you know, to walk on stage to see it playing. Um, so hey, I'm John. I'm going to talk about distributed application logic with Ruby um, and Redis. So I'll first talk to you about my company, AppBoy. So what we are is we are a marketing automation platform focused for the needs of mobile first marketers. Essentially, what we mean by that is we think that the world is changing because of the mobile device. Consumers are interacting with brands and apps ac across lots of different platforms, lots of different channels. You, know, you have tablets, watches, iPads, uh, cars, smart devices, websites. And what we do is we work with customers to help them understand what their users are doing and really give them personalized, relevant, one-on-one -on -one communications. Essentially, it's about em empowering brands to build long-term relationships. So essentially what this means, um, in, in layman's terms, essentially we work with companies like SoundCloud or Domino's Pizza um, to help send you like push notifications personalized to what you are interested in, to help send you emails that are relevant to things that you were shopping with Zappos, one of our customers, or Etsy, another one of our customers. Or if you open up Tinder and you get in that message, um, Apple is helping Tinder control what types of messages users should get based on their behavior, how many matches they get, you know, how attractive they are, those things. Um, not really. So uh, getting all this data to AppBoy is a pretty big infrastructural challenge. We collect over 100 billion data points every month from our customers. Um, we're, we're, our SDK is installed on well over a billion devices across the entire globe, and uh, we, help make, uh, help, we help those brands make sense of all of that data. And so at this scale, what we have to do is parallelize everything that we do. Um, but in a, in a distributed setup, what we need is still the ability to, mo to manage program flow. And what that ultimately comes down to is having synchronization. So what I want to talk about today is how we control concurrency at AppBoy, and I'm going to dive into a couple of different examples. So here's kind of the agenda of what we're going to talk about. So I'm going to go through a few different use cases, and then we're actually just going to hop into some code that I'll go through, and we'll look at quick demos of how to actually use Redis to control rate limiting um, or to control concurrency in a distributed system. So we're going to start off talking about rate limiting API requests. Uh, we're going to move into send volume for sending things like push notifications and emails, limiting send speed for those emails or push notifications, and then lastly, we'll finish with talking about how we control access to shared resources. So as I mentioned, we need to do a lot of synchronization when you have a large distributed system. I and mean, we have hundreds of servers that are processing all that data, hundreds of servers that are sending messages out to those billion devices that we're installed on. And we use Redis for synchronization. And ultimately, everyone here at RedisConf knows what Redis is, but it's basically an in-memory database that is super fast. And what's great about Redis is that it has a lot of native data types and data structures to support um, a, a wide variety of use cases. You have sets, you have hashes, lists, um, you can, you, it, it's very good at counting things. We, we now learn that there's like geospatial indexing that's going on into Redis. So there's a lot of cool uses that you can make out of this database. So the first use case I wanna talk about is how we can limit API requests. And anyone who's ever implemented an API probably has dealt with this. Anyone implemented an API here? Great, so I'm sure you know that you don't wanna just have people be able to send an unlimited number of calls to your API. You wanna throttle them to be able to limit how many resources you're giving them. Maybe they're an enterprise customer and you wanna give them a million API calls an hour. Or maybe they're paying you 10 bucks a month and you only wanna give them 1,000 an hour. Um, ultimately, the, the need for doing that is so that you don't overwhelm your own resources or have one bad actor um, use more than their fair share of API calls. So essentially, if you want to build an API rate limiter, we use Redis for that, and we think it's a fantastic use case. So um, essentially, what you do is in your API, at the start of each request, you just increment a counter for that time period. So if you're incrementing, if you're rate limiting based on an hourly basis or a minute basis or a 15-minute period basis, um, you can just have a key based on that and increment it. So we're going to pop into some code that does this, and I'll show you an example here. So here we have a very simple rate limiter where we're going to take in an API key for one of our consumers, and we're going to limit it on a minute basis, and we'll record how many um, API calls that, that customer gets. And then in our controller, what we can do is ask a question, you know, should we rate limit this user? Should we allow this request to succeed, or should we fail it? And all that this request does 
is you can see that it does an increment on a key. Um, and it also, because we're doing it on a minute basis, we can expire it for efficiency. And then we can just check if they have enough remaining requests for their limit. And when you look at it in the key lines 20 to 24, you can see that the key is based on a minute basis. So I generate the key using both the API key and then the year, month, day, hour, and minute of whatever right now is. So if we pop into a console and run this code, we can create our rate limiter. We can give it a new API key. And let's say we want to allow five per minute. So now we can just ask questions. Like, should we, if, if someone made an API call right now, should we rate limit them? No, we should not. Should we rate limit them? No. And you'll see this, I've made three requests, four requests, I've made five requests, and now we should rate limit them. Because they've gotten to the point where they have made five requests, and that is their, their limit. And you can now see, well, I bet that we just uh, move forward in time by a minute, um, that if you keep asking this question over and over again, you'll see that it will reset every minute. So this is a very, very, very simple use case of Redis um, for rate limiting. And we're gonna talk about another one that's also very simple, and then we're gonna get into some much more complicated examples of how we uh, do throttling and concurrency at AppBoy. So another example is send volume. So AppBoy customers send messages to their end users. So as I mentioned, SoundCloud, Tinder, those types of customers of ours will use us to send things like push notifications or emails to their user base. Uh, and sometimes they want to limit how many messages that they want to send to. You know, SoundCloud has tens of millions of monthly active users, but if they're sending out a campaign, they might want to just test it and maybe send it just to 20,000, just to 100,000 and see how that actually works. Or they want to do testing, where they want to send 10,000 users this message A and another 10,000 users message B. So we actually offer a feature that allows them to limit that. Um, but as I mentioned, that all the sending happens across our hundreds of servers. So what we need to do is control the number of messages that we send on a distributed basis um, and still somehow globally throttle all of that. So this is the exact same concept. All we need to do is keep a counter of how many messages we have sent, and then we can just increment that and see if we have actually surpassed that limit. So we're going to hop into code here. It's going to be the exact same thing. Where what we have in this limiter is we're taking in an identifier and the limit of how many things we're going to throttle. And now we have a function, um, say we're sending to users, a function called limited users that takes in an array of users and then is going to return which of those users we should actually send to. And the way that this works is similarly, uh, we generate a key based on the identifier and then we just increment a number. And then what we get back from Redis is how many increments we've done. And from there, we can just compare that to our limit, as you see on lines 15, um, to see if we should continue dispatching this message to other people. So if we look through an example of this, so I'm going to new up my send volume limiter. And let's say we're going to limit it to 10 um, users or who we want to send to. So the first thing we can call is we can call this limited users function and say we're going to send to users A, B, and C. And this function will tell us we can send to A, B, and C. We can call it again. And it will also tell us to send to A, B, and C. We can call it again. We've only sent nine now, but we've sent to A, B, and C three times. When we call this again, what we expect to happen is that we'll only be able to send to A because we'll have hit our rate limit of 10. And if we ever try to call this again, we're now not going to be able to send to anyone. So this is a very simple concept. Same with the API rate limiting one, where just very simple counters can be used to throttle things on a distributed level. So now we'll get into things that are a little more interesting and exciting. Um, so one other thing that we do at AppBoy is we throttle sending speeds. So this was actually something that we never thought we'd have to build, um, but it turns out that um, for a number of our customers, AppBoy simply sent messages too quickly um, for their servers to be able to handle it. So if you think about a push notification, let's say your app has a million users, and we send a push notification to all million of those users, and we send it in two seconds. 
and then most of those users open the app immediately. I mean, how many times you've gotten a push on your phone, you just open it up, right? So lots of people did that, and what would happen is we crashed apps, and uh, it was more than just one time that we have crashed apps uh, from this sort of situation. So our users wanted to cap how fast we were sending in order to avoid an outage. Uh, on the flip side, in addition to push, you also want to apply a similar principle to emails. Because when you think about how emails actually get delivered into people's inboxes, providers like Gmail or Yahoo um, or any other email service provider are going to try to figure out, is your email spam or not? And one of the ways in which they do that is trying to figure out your email volume and uh, how much email you're sending. If you go from not sending any emails at all to all of a sudden in an hour push out 10 million emails, it's possible that you're a spammer. And, th and they think about that, they use that as a signal because you just don't have the history of sending that. So if you actually send your email slower when you're just getting started, um, you can actually prevent your, your emails being marked as spam. And so this was a great feature for us to implement for our customers. So the way that we're going to do this is a little more complicated now. Now we're going to get into Lua. Um, so essentially what we're going to have is message, the message sending processes are going to attempt to send at a given time and delay as necessary. So you can think about this, that if we wanted to delay at 100 messages per minute, we have a bunch of different workers here that each, say, have 50 users that they want to send to, and we want to send 100 a minute. So what they're going to do is ask Redis. They're going to say, hey, I want to send 50 of them, and I want to send them right now, um, but we have a 100 per minute cap. And Redis will return back a timestamp of when we can actually do the sending. So in, for, for worker one right here, Redis will say, you can send this message right now. For worker two, it's going to say the same thing. I want to send to 50 of them. I want to send them right now. And we have a 100 limit. And similarly, Redis will be able to know that they can do that. But on the third worker, he's going to say, I want to send 50. And we have a limit of 100. And I want to send them right now. And Redis will actually be able to know that it's not allowed right now. It should send in 60 seconds. So this is the very, very naive algorithm um, that we're going to discuss uh, on how this actually works. OK. So this is a lot more complicated. If you weren't paying attention to those other ones, that was fine. But now this one uh, may be a little hard to follow otherwise. So what we've got is, again, the, the goal is to be able to limit how fast we're sending things. And what we're going to tell Redis is, how fast, how many things we want to send to, so that's like I want to send to 50 users. When I want to try to send to them, so like I want to send to them right now, uh, and then what the limit is. So we have a Lua script that can do this. And if you look at the arguments here, so it's going to take in two keys. We're going to store two things in Redis. What we're going to store is the next available time to send, and then how many messages are already scheduled to send at that time. So that's all Redis is going to store. Again, this is a very naive algorithm. And the arguments that we're going to pass in is when we want to send, so saying like, I want to send right now, how many we want to send to, and then what the rate limit is. So going down this Lua script, the first thing that we have is we're just trying to figure out what does Redis know is the next time to send. Has this method been called before? You know, are we looking at, can I sen start sending right now, or does Redis already know that we need to start sending a few minutes from now? So um, we're going to use that key that stores the next timestamp and just grab that down. Um, and then we're going to use that on line 14 um, to figure out if we have a timestamp for when we should send to it. Uh, if the next time, and so if we have that case, basically what, what situation we're in is someone has said, hey, Redis, I want to send 50 messages. Can I send right now? And Redis has said, no, you have to send that one minute from now. Um, so in that situation, we can see um, if we're requesting to send either in the future, like more than a minute from now, or if we're sending right now. Um, and what we're going to do is if the case where we, the next time we want to send is um, before the requested time to send. So let's say that Redis says, you can send at 5.01 PM, and I'm trying to send at 5.05 PM, which is what's going on at line 17, um, then that's totally fine. Because at 5.05 PM, we haven't had any messages scheduled there. So what we'll do is we'll go ahead on lines 18 to 22 is we'll set and we'll store that value, saying at 5 or 5 p.m. you're free to send and you're free to send 50 of them, and then we also have some expirations just to um, just to clean up after ourselves. Um, so assuming we aren't in a situation like that, so we want to send at 5:01 p.m. and Redis 
already has information about 5.01 PM. Um, that's where we get into lines 25 through 29, uh, or 24 through 29, I'm sorry, where if Redis knows about 5.01 PM and has already sent 50 messages, we can just increment the counter there again and see how many we've sent at that time, and then just do a quick check. Have we sent more than we are able to send? And if so, then that's fine. We can move forward. Otherwise, we move ahead by one minute. All right, so that's essentially how the Lua script works. So we're going to run this code um, with a method time to send, where we're just going to try to limit ourselves for Redis and say, I want to send 50 messages every minute. Um, and we'll just kind of see how this process actually works. So I'm going to new up my send speed limiter. I'm going to give it an identifier. And let's say that we want to send 100 per minute. So in this, we have a method time to send that takes in the number of recipients that we want to send to. So I want to send to 10 recipients. When can I send it? And it says you can send it right now at 11.33, which is exactly what time it is up there. Now I want to send to 70 recipients. And it's saying I can send it at 10.33. Um, but now I want to send to 20 recipients. Um, so at this point, I can still send to 1033, but now when I want to send to a subsequent recipient, because 10 plus 70 plus 20 is 100, Redis is going to give me the next timestamp. And it's going to say, you can't send to this one user until 1134. Uh, so as I mentioned, this is a very naive algorithm. And why is it naive? Um, because if you tried to pass in, say, like 150 users, um, it, wouldn't, it would still let you do that at 1135. Um, it doesn't have a concept of like splitting it out, being like these 100 can go at this minute and these 50 can go at that minute. It also is pretty naive in the sense that it only keeps track of one timestamp. So um, time, fortunately, moves forward. Um, but if, if any process ever tried to say, I want to send 100 of them 10 minutes from now, what that's going to do in this algorithm is it's going to advance the counter 10 minutes from now. And the sec as soon as one of them says, I want to send 10 minutes from now, you're not going to have any sends up until that point. Um, so you can overcome all of those things by making this more complicated. Uh, but here's just a really quick, simple example of how you can start throttling um, your speed by using uh, Redis in order to do that. OK. So uh, the last example that I want to get into is the concept of controlling shared resources. So when you have increased concurrency, one of the big challenges that you can run into is it can easily overwhelm servers, especially if you have a database. And you have hundreds of servers that are all trying to do a write or all trying to do reads at the same time. You can very quickly crash your system. So one example of this is that we allow our customers to export all the raw data um, from our data warehouse into their system. So I mentioned we do like 100 billion events every single month. And some of our customers are fairly large. They might have a few billion events um, you know, on, on a month basis. And um, if like, SoundCloud wants to export their data and Tinder wants to export their data, it could put a lot of load on our data warehouse. So what we want to do is ensure that if we have a system where we know it can't handle a lot of load, we want to be able to limit that and ensure that we have just a few queries that are able to run at any given time. So conceptually, the way that you control access to this is to use a semaphore type. Is anyone familiar with a semaphore? Cool. Some people have taken their systems classes. Um, so conceptually, semaphores are just counters that can increment and decrement. You can see it's a, a huge theme in control, controlling concurrency that you just count things. Um, but there's some other concepts in semaphores that are important as well, which is blocking and signaling. So you can think of a semaphore uh, kind of like a line going to a bathroom. So let's say you're trying to go to the bathroom and there are three stalls. Right? What happens is you, you knock on the stall, you see if anyone's in, the, in there. If no one's in there, you go ahead and you enter the stall. Um, but if all the stalls are taken, then people just start queuing up and they just wait. And as soon as someone comes out of the stall, the next person goes in and everyone's just waiting for that. So that's what blocking and signaling are. Blocking is like you're waiting in line for the bathroom. Then signaling is someone opens the door and walks out, which tells you, oh, I can go in now. Um, so we're going to implement that using Redis. And so we're going to do a semaphore using a Redis list. So the list is going to simulate that. So if I wanted to control three resources, I would create a list of size three. And each list element is going to represent access to a resource. Now, when I want to grab a resource, what's fantastic about Redis is it has atomic operations. So I can just pop an element off of the list 
or I can do a blocking pop, and we'll actually look at the code and see the difference between these two in a bit. And then when we're done with the resource, when we've finished using the bathroom, we can push that element back onto the list. So this is all well and good, except for the fact that like sometimes you've like, you know, been waiting in line for the bathroom and you keep knocking on it and like you you just couldn't get it to work and like you're if you've been 10 minutes and you're knocking on it and no one's coming out and then you like go ask the manager hey what's going on in the bathroom and there's no one in there um, so like we have to handle that case as well because a process could grab a resource uh, and then it could crash or um, something bad could happen that's unexpected we want to be able to handle that as well we call that concept a stale lock and so we're going to talk about how we do that um, going through code so this again is going to be another bit, a little bit more of a complicated uh, example of a limiter. So we've got here with this semaphore is we're going to take in a name for the semaphore, and this is just our identifier. So um, and how many resources we have. Say we've got you know we're control. We only want to allow three queries at a time. We want to only allow a hundred queries at a time. Uh, when the expiration is. And you'll see that I'm using a lot of expirations in this. Uh, if you ever use rate limiting for Redis, I would highly recommend adding expirations to all the keys you're touching, uh, just so that one, you clean up after yourself, and two, you don't accidentally end up in a scenario where um, you know, yesterday's rate limit is still being applied to today because you forgot to delete it or clean up after it. So we're going to set an expiration. And then we're also going to take in a stale client timeout, which is going to be the number of seconds we're going to allow a lock to be held before we think that it's stale and we're going to break that door down and we're going to go in there and, and get the resource ourselves. So we have a couple of different methods here um, that, we'll, that we'll go through. But conceptually, the biggest method is all around this lock method. So what we want to do is if we are trying to grab a lock, what that would be is I want to grab a resource. I want to enter the bathroom and go do my thing. Um, the first thing that we want to do is create the lock if it doesn't exist. And we do this with Lua for atomicity. So there's, in, this, in this semaphore, the way we're going to implement it is using three keys. One is we're going to have a key for when the semaphore was created. Um, this is a performance optimization we'll get to in a bit. The second is we're going to have the list. And then the third is we'll have a hash. And that hash is going to represent the resource and when it was taken. And so that way we can, we can know, hey, you know, resource one was grabbed five minutes ago. It's stale. And we'll be able to break that. So conceptually, those are the three things that we want. So what we can do is see if, if we've created this list. Um, and it, or if we've created the semaphore, and we, if we haven't, we can create it. Otherwise, we can do nothing. Um, so if you look at this Lua down here, um, so the keys that are passed in, you can see the first key is the list. The second key is the hash of when things were taken. And the third key is when the, the, when the uh, semaphore was created. So we can just check if that created at key exists. And the reason that we do this is because if you've ever used Redis, you know that when you have a list, and you populate it, and then you take all the resources out, and it's a length of list zero, Redis actually thinks that key is gone, like essentially deletes the key when there are no elements left in it, which is, which is great. But we need to know, hey, you know, we need to differentiate between the case of has this not been created or are all of the resources taken. So that's what we're going to use that created at timestamp for. So we check on line 134 if that key exists, then what we're going to, or if it doesn't exist, I'm sorry, just to be paranoid, we'll go ahead and delete the other two things, just so that we're not in like a bad state. And then we'll go through a for loop on line 137 that Elm pushes onto that list the number of resources. So if we're looking at a semaphore of list of length three, uh, resource count three, we're going to add three items into the list. Then we're going to set the created at timestamp, which is line 140, and then just expire things um, in order to, to be good. You can see we didn't do anything with the hash key here besides delete it, and that's because we don't need to. In Redis, you can just start performing operations on keys that don't exist, and Redis will go ahead and go ahead and create those. So going back to the lock method, we have created the lock if it doesn't exist. If there's a stale client timeout, we're going to deal with that, and we'll get to that in just a few minutes. But first, what we'll do is gra try to grab a resource from the list. And there are two options here, which is why Redis is a really great um, system for building your semaphores is you can either block or not block. So as I mentioned, the list contains the resources. So there's, if you have three resources, the list is going to look like 0, 1, 2. You can pop an item off that list. But you can either tell Redis you'll wait for it, you know, basically like I will queue up 
going to the bathroom and wait until someone comes out. Or you can just kind of walk up, see that like, you know, the door's locked and walk away. Um, and so that's what we have in line 41 is that we can do a non-blocking pop if we want. So in parts of your code where you're saying like, let me just check, do I have the availability to run a query? Um, you can do that in a very fast manner. Or you can block and say like, I'll just wait. It's fine. I'll, I'll wait till there's a resource available, which depending on your use case, um, you might want to do one versus the other. Um, so we'll try, see if we can grab the resource, which if we're successful, so we get to line 51, we can see if we're successful. What we're going to do is now in a transaction, record that we took this resource now. So that's what we're doing. We're setting in the taken hash key that we took this resource now. And then we set all those expirations. And again, it's just to clean up after ourselves. Uh, and then we can run whatever code we are um, going to run. And at the end, we're going to release the resource. And releasing the resource is very easy. All you do is you delete the key out of the hash, saying that like, you know, this key is no longer taken. And you push it back onto the available list. Great. So if we take a look at what this looks like, I have actually written a test to go through the semaphore. Uh, and so we're going to run through it. What we're going to do is we're going to new up five threads that run with a test semaphore name. And they have three resources. We're going to give it a 30-second timeout. And what we'll do is um, we're going to try to grab a resource from the semaphore. That's what the lock line is doing on 15. And then just say we're going to grab a resource and sleep for a little bit. Um, and if we don't have, if we didn't get the resource, then we can retry um, in 100 milliseconds. So I'm using a non-blocking pop here. So I'm just checking, can I get the resource or not? And then I'm sleeping for a, a minute. Or I'm sleeping for 100 milliseconds. What this is called in um, computer science terminology is a spin lock. I'm essentially checking and then waiting, checking, waiting, checking, waiting. I'm essentially just spinning uh, until I can get that resource. I could use a blocking timeout and tell Redis, like, oh, I'll wait for up to five seconds to get that lock before timing out. But for simplicity, we're, we're just going to do this here. So if I run this, what you'll see is so we had five threads. The first three threads that happened to run, one, zero, and four, grabbed the resources. They took one, two, and three. And so threads two and three weren't able to get any resources. So they kept trying. They kept trying. They couldn't get anything. And then at some point, those resources were returned. So thread two grabbed resource one, which means that thread one finished. And then thread three grabbed resource two, meaning that thread zero finished. And we were able to get those resources. And I can run this over and over again, and it's going to look exactly the same. You'll see three resources grab things, two resources wait, and then two threads um, finally pick it up. OK. So the last bit about this is handling the stale client timeouts. So if we scroll back up to lock here, we have the code that says if we're going to do stale client timeouts, then let's actually release them. Um, so the way that this works is we're going to do an optimization. So we're going to grab the created at key to see if enough time's elapsed. Because let's say that you have a, a two-minute stale client timeout. You don't want to attempt to break stale locks if, if you know that the semaphore hasn't even been created for two minutes. It's not possible for any of those locks to be stale. Um, so we can just check that right there. So we just grab the create at key. We check if, we, if there's enough time has passed. And if so, what we'll do is now we're going to grab a mutex. The reason that we're going to grab a mutex is if I have five threads and they're all checking if locks are stale, then I have all five threads checking if locks are stale, which takes time. And so I you know, increase my operations fivefold, and I slow down all five threads. I don't want to actually have that happen. Instead, what I want to do is just check for stale locks every x seconds. So you know, if I have a five second stale lock, I only want to check things every five seconds um, to see if, we're, if any of them should be broken. So what we'll do is we're going to grab this lock. And we're going to talk about um, uh, locks right after this. Um, but what's going to happen is Redis will return if we set this key. And what this key says is set this mutex key to true, only set it if it doesn't exist, and then expire it every x seconds, which gives us that, that throttling of every five seconds or so we're going to check for this. If we are the process that won, then let's grab 
all of the resources, so do it get all for the hash. We just iterate over each of the pairs. We can see when a resource was locked. And if it has timed out, we can then just release the resource. So as an example of this, we're going to go back to this semaphore test file. And we have a demo here where what I'm going to do is I'm going to just run what we have above. But I'm going to take the semaphores and I'm going to monkey patch the method to do nothing. So when one of the threads calls release, it's going to do nothing instead of releasing it. Um, and then we're going to grab a lock. And uh, you'll see that now that's going to be held. That won't actually get unlocked. And then we'll run it again, and we'll watch one of these processes break the lock. OK, so what happened here was the first couple lines of what we've seen before. Threads 4, 0, and 1 grab the first few resources. Threads 2 and 3 are waiting. Threads 2 and 3 grab the lock. And now we have this other semaphore process that's going to grab the lock at line 41, and we're going to hold it. Um, and then we're just going to do nothing for two seconds. And we're going to then run again with a one second stale lock timeout. So because we sleep for two seconds, and then we say the timeout is one second, we are expecting to break the lock. And that's exactly what you see happen. You see that when this comes down, the first process is going to unlock three because it's stale. And so then things are going to work again. So threads now threads four, two, and three grab the resources. Um, and then one and zero are left at the end there. So this is a pretty standard concept in any type of semaphore locking system. You need to be careful with this, though. Anytime you're introducing the concept of unlocking a stale lock, you are potentially exposing yourself to code errors that can cause you to have more resources than you want. Because imagine if resource three wasn't stale. It just was in, it was, you know, in the bathroom for a really long time. Um, no one wants that. So like, what could happen is if you, so like we use this with a data, data warehouse querying, as I mentioned. We want to limit to say only each customer only gets like five queries. Uh, we expect those queries to finish up within two to three minutes. But sometimes they don't. You know, sometimes they take like, you know, 10 minutes we, we've seen in one, happen, in, in one situation. And in that case, if you set your stale lock timeout too low, like you set it to seven minutes, because you're like, oh, you know, it has to 133% go past what we expect it to before we break it. Um, but then one of them does take 10 minutes. What's going to happen is that lock is going to be broken by some process and then returned by that process that took 10 minutes. And instead of limiting to what you thought was only five resources, now you've got six back in your set. I'm sorry, back in your list, um, and it can be problematic. What we do at AppBoy to protect against this is we rotate our semaphore keys. So in the example that we've given here, I have a static name for the semaphore. It's just called test semaphore. But we actually rotate semaphores through different timestamps um, to protect against this problem. There are lots of other ways you can solve this problem. Um, but the easiest and most simple one for us was to just use our key based on time so that every say, two hours, the semaphore restarts. So even if we end up in a situation where we wanted five resources, but due to stale lock timeouts, now there's like six or seven, um, in an hour or two, it's not going to matter, because we're going to have a new key that is going to be back limited to five. So before I finish up with q and I only have a few minutes left, uh, I want to talk very briefly about those locks. So we can use locks to throttle the frequency of an event. So you saw that in the stale lock checks, we're using a lock to throttle only checking for locks every few minutes. Um, we actually use this for a variety of purposes at AppBoy, one of which is flushing data to a database. So we keep all of our analytic time series data in MongoDB. And MongoDB is a defined database, but its write scalability can sometimes be a little bit challenging. And, and when you're working with the amount of volume that we're working with, um, it just sometimes can't handle it. So for one example that we use is we buffer a lot of data to Redis and then we periodically flush it over to MongoDB. And we can control that to, on a per customer basis. If we've got you know, a really large customer like SoundCloud, we can just flush their data every 10 seconds. Or if we have um, you know, a small customer, um, we can flush their data on a less frequency basis. So I'm going to just show you some examples of locks. So 
So two frequency locks here is what I'm calling them. Um, the first one is a set lock. We already saw an example of this. What you're going to do is you just tell Redis, hey, set a key if it doesn't exist, and expire that key at, at that frequency that you want to check. So if you want to do something every one minute, um, you can expire this key in 60 seconds, and Redis will ensure that it only gets set once every 60 seconds. Uh, and so if you have a process that is doing it, this, this method will only return true once every 60 seconds. There's another way that you can do this, and we actually used to use this way, um, we actually still do in some of our code, um, which is a get set lock. So one of the things that we want to do is keep track of when the last timestamp was we did something. Um, so say like we won't allow you to write data to MongoDB once every 10 seconds, but we want to make sure that we've actually written to it, maybe for like we have monitors, for example, that, that run based off this, that like check that data is flushed at the intervals we expect them to be flushed. Um, so what we can do is use another atomic directive for get set and do more of an optimistic lock. So if you've ever worked with locks, you know there are multiple different types. There's a pessimistic lock and an optimistic lock. A pessimistic lock is one where you essentially are going to try to take a resource before you start doing something. And it's pessimistic because you're like, you know, I gotta grab this before I can do anything with it. So you're, you're, you're kind of going into it thinking, ah, I probably won't be, be able to grab it. An optimistic lock assumes that it's going to be able to move ahead with it, and then right before it gets to the commit phase, it checks if there are any conflicts, and if there are conflicts, then it aborts. So we can simulate this to some extent using a get set. What get set is, is a Redis operation that both atomically sets the value of a key and returns the previous value of the key in, at in an atomic fashion. So what we're gonna do in this get set lock is we're gonna bring up our key, um, so it's just based on the name. We're going to get it. And the thing that we're going to store at the key is the timestamp of when we last did the thing. Now we can check if it's null, meaning that like, we're the first one to ever use this, return true. Otherwise, if it's been you know, more than, say, five seconds, um, then, then we're going to go ahead and proceed. So that is the race condition. Line 15 is very racy, right? You have two threads that come in. They both do a Redis get. They both think it's been more than five seconds, so they both get to proceed. So now what we're going to do is we're going to get set the value and redo the check. So both of those threads will run this code to get set on line 16, but only one of them is going to get the old value, the value that's more than five seconds ago. The other thread is going to get you know, time.now because there are two threads that are in play right here. And so if we redo the check, uh, then we can actually see if we can acquire the lock. And so in my final demo here, we can look this up with a frequency lock. So we'll do it once every four seconds. We have this set lock that will return true once every four seconds. It's probably about there. And then we can also do the exact same thing um, with the get set lock, which has the same outcome, but is implemented a little bit of a different way. And the benefit of this, as I mentioned, is um, you can now keep track of when you last did the thing, because you don't have to use any expirations. Uh, so that is believe the last slide that I have. Um, I've got all this code available on GitHub. So if you were taking pictures of the screen, you can just go to uh, GitHub. My name is John Hyman. I have a repo that has all this code. You can kind of take a look through it there. Uh, and then there's, it seems there's five minutes left. So if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to talk about them. Yeah, so the question was, in addition to the stale lock, how do you actually kill the process that's running? Um, because it could be in the middle of doing a query or have some side effect. Uh, so the short answer to that is we don't, we don't when the locks are broken. Um, we have, uh, at AppBoy, we actually have a whole variety of stuck process monitoring that will just kill things, and we try to write things as idempotently or as transactional-based as possible. Um, that when they happen, it alerts our dev team, our DevOps team, and we're able to go in and see like if some state is in a bad state. Um, but in general, a lot of the things that we use semaphores for uh, are things where the primary reason of controlling access to resources is per for performance. You know, we either don't want to spend more money to make like the data warehouse bigger, or we um, you know don't want some customer who's only paying you know certain number of dollars a month to use more resources than a customer who's paying uh, more than that. So the question was if we actually use eval, uh, which is the Redis operation to send a string to evaluate a Lewis script, or there's some other operations like eval SHA where um, you can just give a SHA of a hash. So what we do 
in our code base is we actually have the Lewis scripts uh, defined all at the top of the files that actually use them. And uh, anytime we need to use the Lewis script, we make sure we create another class. So we keep the responsibility for that action entirely in the class. Uh, and then we've written our own methods that we call eval safe, um, where it actually will attempt the eval SHA. So because the script is defined in the function, we just do a SHA one hash of it. And if we get a Redis error back that says no script, um, then we do an eval. Uh, and so we don't do any preloading. We actually just allow the application to lazily load in all of our Lewis scripts, just with a very small wrapper that we've written. So, so the question is, uh, this is the last question we're going to do. The, the, the question was, um, for throttling based on send speed, why not use another data type like a sorted set instead of Lewis scripting, where we could try to push things out with timestamp as the score and then the number of things um, at, as the value. So there's some challenges if you actually try to do that. So one is that we actually don't know how many messages we're sending to in advance. Um, so sometimes our customers can say, we want you to send an email to all of the people who use the app this week who have made more than $10 in purchases. We don't want to compute that in advance and get a count to figure it out. We just want our systems to, and all of that, in fact, gets processed um, fully parallelized anyway. I um, mean, we don't even know the count until the reduce phase finishes and we actually are set to go, but by the time we actually know of the count, it's possible some messages have already been going out. So that makes it challenging. The second is the fact that um, there aren't great operations in the for sets. You can essentially just set something in a sorted set. You can't increment, um, and you also can't have any kind of complex type. So if I wanted to send to Alice, Bob, and Carol, um, I would need to represent that like, okay, I've, here are three more users to send to and try to slot them in somewhere. Uh, ultimately, you'll probably run into atomicity issues where if you check the sorted set to figure out where to slot them, it's not going to work out and you'll need to do something atomic, which is the whole reason behind Lua is in purely atomicity. Okay, great, so uh, I'm totally out of time. Thank you all very much for coming to the talk.